Praise the Lord. And uh, this is my beautiful wife, Beverly, and uh, y'all y'all know there's five Sundays. Somebody say five Sundays. There's five Sundays in the month of March, so you can really get saturated in the Word. Praise God. And uh, she was mentioning that uh, Pastor Pearson's at Eagle Mountain Church, they're experiencing a great move of God and supernatural healings and manifestation of the Holy Ghost. But we're believing God for the same thing right here in Virginia Beach, Rivers of Living Water Church. We're the same spirit of faith, praise God, and uh, he, He's doing the same thing for us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I, I know the, the Lord, the Spirit of God moved in uh, skin conditions this morning. And the word of knowledge and then the manifestation of the healing gifts, praise God. So, uh, but we've got uh, this book we're teaching from Reverend Tony Cook's book, In Search of Timothy. And in case you're wondering, we do have extra copies available. And so the premise of this book is that every Paul needs a Timothy. Amen. And every Timothy needs a Paul. That's right. Amen. And so they, they helped each other to fulfill uh, each other's calling. And uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and start talking. Amen. What about, I'm going to read some excerpts from the book and then you can expound if you like. Let's, uh, let's pray before we move forward. But Father, we just come before you. We humble our hearts before you. We thank God that you, uh, Lord, founded the church upon the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Lord, we thank you that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, regardless of the schemes and wiles of the wicked one. We thank God that the blood of Jesus has been applied. We thank you, Lord, that every need shall be supplied and nothing shall be denied. So we enter into rest because we know we've passed the test and praise God we'll get your best. We thank you tonight for utterance in the Holy Ghost, for the word of faith going forth, for receptive hearts and minds. And we speak life to this church. We speak great multiplication. And the blessing of the Lord here, we thank you, Lord, for a successful and prosperous ministry. Not that man should glory in it, but that the Lord Jesus Christ himself be exalted in all that we do and say. For it is in his mighty name that we pray. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, last time we, we got through the introduction. So now we're actually at chapter one. So I'm just going to read, because I love this chapter one, because this first part that I was reading... You'll see. Chapter 1, The Challenges of Leadership. And this is uh, Reverend Tony Cook. He was one of our teachers at Rhema. He's an excellent teacher, one of the best teachers that I've ever sat under. Yeah. Now, he is, a, he is a Butler fan, but I don't hold that against him. So we have a little rivalry, and I had to take my comment off Facebook because I wanted to walk in love. And I didn't want to gloat over the victory, but uh, Tar Heels are moving on. But anyway, we love Reverend Cook and uh, thank God for his ministry. And he was like an associate pastor there at Rama under Pastor Hagen for like 21 years. And uh, so just a meek and humble spirit and uh, very qualified to write this uh, teaching. Amen. I, I know you'll be blessed by it as well. So this is part of our, our ministry and leadership training series. And so this, we're going to get into chapter one tonight. Let's see how far we get through it. The challenges of leadership. I'm just going to read this. A spiritual leader I know had a large congregation. Everything seemed fine until one of his top staff members, one of his key assistants, decided he could do things better. The assistant took more than 30% of the congregation and started his own work. Needless to say, it was a painful split. When this type of thing occurs, questions are asked. The armchair quarterbacks begin their second guessing. If only the leader had been more connected with his staff, this wouldn't have happened. Or if only the leader had developed a better relationship with his congregation, such a large percentage wouldn't have been susceptible to being pulled away. After the split, the leader maintained his work with the part of the congregation that remained, and it was still a good-sized group. But the leader also decided to go ahead and pioneer a new work, another congregation in a different location. Like most new works, this one was small, very small in fact, but the leader saw great potential in this fledgling group. This time a split did not occur, it was worse. This time the leader lost his entire congregation. The leader later did some things that enabled him to recapture some of, some of that lost congregation and to rebuild it even larger, but the whole process was not without challenges and setbacks. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into the rebuilding process. This, oh, do you want to say something about it? Uh, I, 
it's amazing to me that uh, I, I read this book over 10 years ago. And now 10 years of pastoral ministry experience, uh, you, you get new insight into what you've read. And I know uh, so a few years ago we went to a pastor's conference. And one of the pastors that pastors up in Northern Virginia stood up. He said he's pastored uh, 29 years. He said, I'm so-and-so, I've pastored 29 years. And he said, and I want you to know I've pastored six different congregations. And so, uh, you know, because I'm a big college basketball fan, I know about how the pros can take all your best players. <laughs> and you're just left as the leader to, to rebuild the team. And so that uh, takes a special grace from God. Amen. The, the ones that remain uh, faithful. And uh, so thank God for, uh, for the capability and the ability and the grace to rebuild. And the patience to rebuild. Yes. Praise the Lord. So this first leader had a close relative who also went into the ministry. He had a true shepherd's heart and was an excellent teacher. The Spirit's presence was with him in a remarkable way and he got great results. However, he also faced challenges in his leadership. He had a lot of turnover. People came and went on a regular basis. He had retention problems. And on one occasion, there was a mass exodus from his congregation. This leader also had challenges with his staff. His top staff members didn't, get, didn't always get along well. They were competitive and had periodic arguments among themselves. It was later discovered that he had a staff member who was actually involved in embezzling ministry funds. He had another staff member who was known for being impulsive in both word and deed. This individual lost it one time under pressure and actually assaulted another person. Because you have enough interest and support of ministry to, well, I'm reading this book, to pick up this book, but to read this book, there are some questions I'd like for you to consider. Would you want to work on the staff of one of the aforementioned leaders? Yeah, that's kind of a, not just a rhetorical question, but... Those type of situations, actually most people like to go into what's called a turnkey situation as far as the church is concerned. You know, growing, thriving congregation, uh, all the ministry teams and leadership teams are in place. You, you know, the pastor just kind of shows up and ministers the word of God. Everything's running like a smoothly oiled machine. And uh, it just takes a special grace from God to, to come into a situation that's challenging. So sometimes when you follow the call that God has for you, it's not always, you know, uh, what, what Dad Hagen used to say, flowery beds of ease. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, so, but, uh, but God's will and God's assignment is always the best for your life. And so the question that Brother Cook was asking, in the description of these problem problematic ministries, would, would you like to be part of that team that he just described? Don't give the answer away. Okay. She's going to... Would you want to work for a leader who loses more than 30% of his congregation and then starts a new work and has the whole thing go under, at least temporarily? Would you want to work for a leader whose staff doesn't always get along well and where there's a high turnover rate among the congregation? Who are these leaders? This is the thing. Who are these leaders? Who are they? Who are they? We don't have Jeopardy music, but we could, we could play it. Who are these leaders? Do you in have any guesses? In the form of question, we could have an answer. So then Good Reverend point. Cook says, the first leader I described is God the Father. The second leader is Jesus. He said, I shared their history in a slightly veiled and disguised way on purpose. We would all agree that God the Father and Jesus are wonderful, perfect in every way, yet they both encounter problems in their leadership. Yeah, yeah God's, God's archangel Lucifer rebelled against him and took one third of the angels. Later, Adam and Eve, God's second congregation, he puts that in quotes, turned against God, and as the representative heads of the human race, broke relationship and fellowship with him. And of course, to say that Jesus' disciples were rough around the edges is to put it mildly. Were the problems we describe problems of leadership or problems of followership? Was it that God the Father and Jesus failed to exercise good leadership or that others failed to exercise good followership? Again, we know that God and Jesus are both perfect and infallible. Therefore, their leadership skills leave nothing to be desired. But good leadership cannot achieve optimal results without good followership. Amen. 
So, uh, you know, the, there are three principles of stewardship that Jesus mentions in Luke 16. And one of the primary uh, principles he mentions is that he that is faithful in the least. So a lot of people want to start on top. Top of the Fortune 500. Top of the, you know, fastest growing congregation in America or what have you. But uh, how many of you know God, God assigns us to different geographic locations? There are some locations we're called that we're just called to visit there. Because everybody doesn't do well in every environment. Amen. Amen. Somebody called to be a mechanic, you know, if you got them up in public speaking, they'd just be challenged because they, they work with their hands and that's what God's gifted them to do. And so that doesn't mean one is smarter than the other, but God has given us different abilities and assignments. Amen. And uh, so I, I like to say it this way, that we ought to strive to be the type, <clears throat> type of follower that we would want if we were the leader. I'll go over that again. We should all strive to be the type of follower that we would want if we were the leader. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, I had just written a note in my book that I remembered John 6, 66. That's when Jesus, yes, that's when Jesus, um, he had a lot of followers at one point, and everybody left him but the 12. And he said, you know, are you going to leave me too? That John 6, 66. That's what everybody, he had a huge crowd of violence. Got it? Yeah, John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake, hey listen, there, I mean, we'd like to say that in pastoral ministry, and church ministry, that there aren't any Judas spirits, but, uh, you know, you, you just have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, praise God. Just do what God's called you to do and not be... Uh, deterred by that. But uh, 71 said he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. You know there were two two, uh, two Judases. Uh, for he, he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Amen. And so, uh, what else you got to say about that? Oh, I was just going to say, obviously the, the rest of the crowd misunderstood what he was saying. What Jesus was talking about. They misunderstood him. Yeah. They got offended at what he said and yeah. then they just left. Yeah, he just told him. He, he prophesied that he would go to the cross and he said, uh, you know, you'll, you'll uh, eat of my flesh and you'll drink of my blood or you have no life in you. And they thought, what is he talking about? Yeah. Is he talking about cannibalism? I mean, what, what is he talking about? But uh, he, they didn't understand the, what he was trying to tell them, that he was called to go to the cross for the sins of the world, and he had to go. Yeah. There is no other way, because there, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, and sometimes people don't realize how costly the sin is, but it costs God his most precious yes. uh, commodity in the universe, his precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no <clears throat> sin, who did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong, but he took our place. And he took what we deserved on his cross. Thank God. And so a lot of times uh, it's important to remember his sacrifice. You know, when we're going through some difficult challenges or areas of challenge. And the Bible said to consider Jesus. Lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Amen. Amen. Uh, I know a lot of times when we're... Uh, Receiving communion as a church family. I, I read that scripture in 1 Corinthians. And always that part stands out to me. The Lord, Paul said, For I, I deliver to you that, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two. 32, I deliver to you that which I also received of the Lord, that the same night in which he was betrayed. Remember he told Judas, that which you do, do quickly. Yeah. He that dips the sop with me, 
He's the one that's going to sell me out. He knew what he was going to do. And told him. Prophesied it to him. But how many of you know that, that, that hurt his heart. But he still moved forward with the will of the Father. Undeterred. Unfazed. Didn't mean he didn't feel it. I mean he loved Judas. But he prophesied. He said it had been better for that man that he was never born. Amen. I said amen. And you know Judas tried to re repent later. But it was actually too late. He had already sold him out. Amen. So good leaders need good followers. No doubt leadership is a huge issue. And I mean, we're talking to leaders, you know, you could be leading a department in the church. You could be leading a nexus group in the church. You could, you know, uh, be leading in the future, possibly. Um, we've been privileged to have some excellent teaching on leadership in the body of Christ over the past several, several years, and thank God for it. Leaders must lead, and we're grateful for all the vital truths that help leaders develop their skills to lead more effectively. So we're not putting that aside, you know, that you can take some leadership training. But followers also have a part to play. They must seek to excel in following and in faithfully carrying out their duties and responsibilities. Paul's statement in Romans 1, 11 and 12 illustrates this point. Romans 1, 11 and 12 says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Amen. So the way God designed it is that we need each other. Leaders can't lead without followers. Followers need leaders to develop their own leadership skills that God has in them, to develop their own calling. Amen. And so uh, it's important that we uh, that we are faithful in, in what seems like the least. I know my first assignment out of Rhema, I thought for sure, praise God, we're going to save a continent. Come on, me and Jesus, let's go preach the gospel. Hallelujah, man, I was fired up, praise God. I mean, I was ready to take the healing power of God uh, in the dark regions, praise the Lord. Say, come on, and just, you know, challenge the devil to a fight. When the Holy Ghost gets on you, you get bold. Amen. And uh, my, my first assignment was uh, First Baptist Church of Broken Arrow, who, who thought all the tongue talkers were crazy. <laughs> And I won't forget, they had a they had a book come out from, I won't say the author's name, you may know it, but from Dallas Theological Seminary, and, and it was called Charismatic Chaos. And it was just, uh, you know, these these glossolaliacs, these tongue talkers, they're, they're very sincere, but they're, they're just misguided in their interpretation of Scripture. And so that's where I got to work, coming right out of Ramah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, so it, it, it worked some things in me, praise God. And uh, but but thank God, uh, you know, learned learned a lot of great things from that from that assignment. Praise the Lord. Um, notice how Paul began his letter to the church at Rome. As a leader, he automatically thought of what he could do to serve and to help the believers. And what he wrote in verse eleven essentially reflects this one-way street mentality. He says, in effect, I'm going to come and impart something to you, and it's going to help you. But then Paul realizes that his ministry isn't a one-way street. In effect, Paul says in verse 12, it's not just me giving to you, but we need to work together in this matter. There's a mutual give and take here. I've got to do my part, but you've got to do your part also. And when we mutually do our jobs, then we're all going to be blessed and encouraged. So it's not just leadership that's going to get the job done. Followership is a big part of the equation as well. There's no doubt that good leadership helps to inspire and motivate good followership, but good followership encourages good leadership as well. So when both parties function well, it raises all of us higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to re read the uh, questions for reflection. And then, you, then, you know, rhetorically, you can think of what your answer is or you can just expound. What that? What was your reaction when you realized that the two leaders described early in the chapter were God the Father and Jesus? Yeah. It shocked me too. Yeah, when I read it the first time, I was like, yeah. I always think about how wily and deceptive that the enemy is that one-third of the angels yeah. Yeah. were tricked yeah. 
and deceived. And like, like, like Peter said to Jesus, where shall we go? I mean, when you're, when you're in the Lord's presence, that's the highest you can get. I mean, you, you're not going to get any better. And somehow the devil painted this picture that following him was going to be better for a third of the angels. And so that, that always amazes me that he's able to, to do that. And uh, when, he, when he talked to Eve, he said he painted her this picture that actually disobeying what God said was going to be better for them. But it was a trick. It was a deception. So what am I trying to say? That within, you know, Christendom, within the local church, within uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be spiritually aware and discern that type of spirit and deal with it in prayer. Amen. If we discern some gossipitis rising up, amen. I said amen. It's a shame, you know, for uh, people to work so faithfully, and I'm talking about for years, to show up Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Friday night after Friday night, all the different ministries we have here at this local church, and have just a few people with a few loose lips trying to sink ships and just wag their tongue. And think they're right and think they're exposing something when, uh, you know, like I said uh, prior, that the enemy so so very deceptive that he would he would get, you know, people in the church to fight each other rather than join arms and work together. Amen. I mean, how about some pastors working together? I'm going to get bold here. How about some churches working together? <laughs> Well, who's going to be in charge? How about Jesus is in charge? How about we all just work together? Praise the Lord. And there, there's like 600 some thousand people here in Virginia Beach that need the gospel. Well, what if we just fight with, it, fight with each other for a second? That's not going to get anywhere. Amen. What else we got? I want to step off my soapbox. Okay, you want me to read another question for reflection? Because we're at the end of the chapter. We actually got through the chapter this time. That's awesome. We got to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the leadership followership challenges God and Jesus face? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. In fact, uh, I mean, the Lord led me. I, I thought for sure when He led me to Regent that I'd be going to School of Divinity, getting the MDiv, you know. But it was so strong in my spirit to, to study leadership studies. And, uh, you know, now in graduate school of leadership studies and, you know, from the academic standpoint, because listen, when you can, when you can inspire and motivate a team, praise God to do what God's called us to do, you, you can accomplish a lot. Amen. I mean, just think about Jesus's team was 12 people. The initial team was 12 people, 12 people to preach the gospel to the nations, 12 people. Just think what 12 people could do, full of the Holy Ghost, working in unity, the Judas spirit kicked out. Amen. You got to get rid of the Judas spirit because Judas spirit's always, how you doing, Pastor? Hallelujah. And you ain't even left the room. Hmm. I don't know who you think to you. Amen. I said, amen. Let me tell you something about the enemy while we're camped out here. He, he works in dishonor. The Holy Spirit works in the spirit of honor. You honor God. You honor the anointing. You honor the Word. Amen. That's where the Spirit, you, you'll notice the Spirit. I, I've always noticed that those that are, that are powerfully anointed of the Holy Ghost, when you, when you show honor for, for the Lord and His Word and, and those that, that He's anointed, it's an amazing thing. And then I've noticed dishonor. Just treat it lightly. Just kind of, yeah, oh well. See, God, God, God created honor. Honor, like honor, stems from a heart of agape love. Man, that's good preaching, Pastor Jim. Praise the Lord. That is good. What if, what if the body of Christ honored each other? Amen. What if a brother or sister said, you know what? I apologize. I should not have said what I said to you. That wasn't right. But if we were all walking in honor, walking in love. Well, let's get off the what ifs and let's get there. Praise God. Amen. 
And I, I just remember Jesus couldn't do any mighty works where there was dishonor. He said that he yeah. could do a few like slight ailments, yeah. he could heal up, but he yeah. couldn't do any mighty works when there was a atmosphere of dishonor, disrespect. That just, that just pushes my butt. I just don't like that. No, I don't. I got victory over Jesus' name. I just really, yeah. But, uh, but I, I remember certain services, the, the anointing would be working, you know, the word of knowledge work. Praise God, somebody get miraculous. I went, I, I went over in the spirit one time in tongues and, and, the, and the Lord said, uh, I'm healing an inner ear infection. So I, I just said what he said. And this young lady come up, I hadn't seen her before or since. And she said, the doctor said, uh, I had an ear, inner ear infection. I said, well, you're the one. I laid hands on her and the Lord healed her. Amen. Well, that, that, that shouldn't be... Uh, what would you say, like, uh, man, that's, that, that ought to be just, just happening. That, that, that's, how, that's how Jesus, he, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you have a need, whatever it is, He wants to, he wants to meet that need. Praise God. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Man, let me tell you, we're in, a, we're in a rebuilding phase. And Rivers, the Living Water Church, by the grace of God, is coming back stronger. We're coming back better, praise God. We're coming back more determined, praise God, to carry out our kingdom purpose in the earth. Full gospel, word of faith, spirit-filled church, preaching the uncompromised word of God with signs and wonders following. Ha, ha, ha. Over 300 strong. Over 300 strong, praise the Lord, in the name of Jesus. Ha, ha, ha. That's where we're starting. So what do you think about the statement, good leadership can't achieve optimum results without good followership? Well, that's just common sense. I, I, worked at a, I worked at Dairy Queen. Five years I managed Dairy Queen. And I complained to the Lord. I just tell you how it is. I said, Lord, you sent me to Rama. I'm ready to preach. I'm not preaching making people Oreo blizzards. All I'm doing is making ice cream sundaes. It had nothing to do with my calling. But you know, uh, we dealt with people not showing up. They were on the schedule. No call, no show. Well, yeah, no job. That's basically what happened. But, and I told him, I said, now I'm not firing you. You fired yourself. When you, you took a commitment uh, to, you gave your word of honor, you're going to be here a certain place, certain time. Now, if there's a, a, of course, some type of circumstance, mitigating circumstance, you call in, you communicate, let us know. We're glad to work with you, and we'll try to cover it. And if you need a personal day, you need a day off, we'll cover it, you know, as long as it's covered. As long as somebody's not doing the work of three people. And uh, let me tell you, it's got a lot to do with the ministry. It's very pertinent, very relevant to the ministry. Amen. But uh, thank God, we, uh, by the grace of God, we got it turned around. I said, we got it turned around. We got, we got this system going that God gave me. Uh, in leadership studies, it's called culture. But uh, it's actually, I call it positive peer pressure. So people typically think of peer pressure in a negative way. When people are enticing you to do things like, let's not go to church today. But what about, what about if it was flipped around and there was a culture where there was positive peer pressure. And people were just walking in the fruit of the Spirit and walking in love. And if somebody wasn't, they're the ones that stood out. It's not like all the negative people and then one, one person doing what God wants them to do. But uh, you, can, you can change that. When you're in a rebuilding phase, you can, you can have it to where there's positive peer pressure. Building each other up. What if the body of Christ wasn't gossiping about each other but was praying for each other? Hallelujah. Yes. Said hallelujah. No, I was thinking. No, no, I was thinking. Patiently waiting. No, no, I was thinking. No, I was actually. I was thinking about you know expect people to show up or communicate. I know. And we've implemented we got high expectations. Well, we've implemented some of that in some of the ministries that we lead. And sometimes people get offended, but I tell them up front in the meeting, you know, if you can't be here, it's courteous 
to let everybody else know or let your leader know that you're not going to be here. If you're a volunteer in a certain ministry, if you're a volunteer in Sam the Greeter's ministry and the Sister Sharon's in charge, it's, it's courteous to let her know, you know what, I'm not going to be able to be there tonight. You know, and just like no call, no show. We understand if, if there's like emergencies or things like that come up, but if somebody just has an attitude about, I'm a volunteer, it doesn't matter, that's disrespecting. Sister Sharon is also disrespecting the Lord because, you know, authority comes from God. So if you think about it in that way, you know, and so we've implemented some of this like worship team and some people have gotten upset because I, you know, I would say, you know, we expect you to show up if you're on the schedule. If you're not, let me know. It's okay. I said, it's okay if you let me know, you know, but, but then just not showing up. And then I would text them and say, hey, missed your church today. Where are you at? No response, you know, for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm back. I'm like, well, that's wonderful that you're back, but you need to communicate, you know, and we've had people get offended. So, I mean, is that a problem with leadership or followership? Well, no. you know, if you, if you have that much respect for your secular job, I mean, what Jesus said, he said that nobody gives a cup of cold water to a disciple in my name that shall lose his reward. So how does somebody know that whatever part they have to play at the church, what, however insignificant they think it is in their own mind, how significant that is to God, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit could go forth because there were so many faithful people in their place that the Lord could move the way He wanted to. Amen? Amen? And, and people could get saved. I, I love some of my pastor friends that say, you know, one pastor said six people got saved today. I said, hallelujah. Because I instantly know as a pastor, there was a lot of greeters that showed up. There was a lot of ushers that showed up. There was children's workers showed up. Nursery workers showed up. Sound people showed up. And I, I know in my mind, a lot of people showed up. They're all working together in whatever role, whatever capacity. And then the word could go forth. And then people that needed Jesus came and got, got saved. Yes. Amen. Yes. I said, Amen. Yes. So thank God for it. Yes. And anytime you go to mature in the Lord, He's going to deal with you about faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I've noticed in, in ministry that when they're sifting and shifting what you have left, every time are mature believers. That's what's left. And so then those mature believers, praise God, we can rebuild again. Yes. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I will say that, you know, the worship team, like everybody, now they, 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 show, don't, up. they show up. And if and they're, they're not going to be here, they communicate. Yeah. They let you know. Yes. So, it's I mean, it's a positive, like what you're saying, positive peer pressure. It's wonderful. Where, you know, whereas before, sometimes it'd be like, you know, you never knew if I'm going to be the only one here. You know what I mean? Sometimes. And so that's not a good feeling. Uh, we walked in before and uh, said, we're so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And uh, that, that's not conducive to, you know, uh, uh, a ministry that can, because e even people in the secular realm know when things are confused or chaotic or not structured. Are you here tonight? And so in creation, God, God turned the light on. Amen. So that's what it's got to be. You've got to turn the light on. I know that sometimes that hurts some people's feelings. But uh, there has to be an accurate assessment of what's going on. And then uh, God began to set things in order. Yes. Yes. Amen. And that's not to say that human beings always run in perfection, but it is to say that there is a concerted hard effort yes. to serve the Lord to the best of our ability and capability. Amen. Man, that's good leadership yes. teaching. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'll take a couple more spoonful. We have the book for $5 if anybody wants it. We have yes. the book, and it is discounted. Yes. Only we $5. Have extras. Yeah. And uh, he basically goes through some of the challenges that the Apostle Paul had in fulfilling his calling, and uh, how that at the end of his ministry, he, he basically, Timothy was the guy standing with him. And he said, at the end of. You know, 35-year ministry, you ought to have like 100 people standing with you at least. <laughs> He's got to call on the one, the one young pastor he can count on, Timothy. Amen? Y'all get anything out of that? 
Praise the Lord. And so how can we apply that? How can we apply yeah, that? Yeah, what we just learned. How can we apply that? We can we can make an effort in our heart to, to show up. Amen. Be a good follower. Be a good leader. I'm here. Yeah. I'm showing up. Mm -hmm. hey, a lot with of a good time, attitude. Listen, but <laughs> listen. With a good attitude. A lot of times, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times, a lot of times, just seeing people's faces encourages pastors. Amen. I just see their face. I say, glory to God, I'm encouraged. Praise the Lord. And so we can encourage each other.